Chapter 277 After the walk, I thought about the fact that most of the wizards are pure bloods in one way or another. If I remember the canon correctly, pure blood Philistines, after Voldemort came to power, had nothing to worry about. In the books, they all worked as before, went about their business, and only especially rich, influential, or holding important positions felt the pressure of the Dark Lords so that they made the right decision. Muggleborns, on the other hand, suffered in one way or another. Take, for example, the inventory of the Muggleborn population, during which quite a lot of adult wizards were killed. Although the circumstances of their death remain unknown, but nevertheless. In any case, Voldemortism is not a regime of power that is pleasant to me, and in this battle of local bison, I am somewhat more sympathetic to the headmaster. Of course, he may not be really kind or anything, but a man with this level of influence and some power simply has no right to think narrowly in terms of kindness to individuals, we are bound to be mere numbers on paper to him. Actually, for Voldemort, we are numbers too, but his methods and his regime are too cruel, and the ultimate goals are unacceptable. In general, one could think forever about this policy, the goals of the two faction leaders, which is right and wrong. But no matter how much you think, it all comes down to one thing, we do not need the Dark Lord. With these thoughts in mind, I return to Grimald Place again, where Kriaker complained about the uninvited but distinguished guests, whom he, of course, at my own order, did not let into the house. And in general, he did not show any activity, leaving the house protected and inaccessible to everyone except the rare postal owls and me. Who came I asked, sitting at the kitchen table. Mrs. Bellatrix. Said the old house elf cheerfully just as I took a sip of tea. Coughing, I comically tapped myself on the chest, and when I came to my senses, I decided to clarify. What did she want? How would old Kriaker know the house elf shrugged, at the same time shifting small containers in one of the lower cabinets by the sink? She stood under the spell opposite, like the navel of the earth, she called me. But the head ordered not to let anyone in. Was she alone? Old Kriaker doesn't know. That is curious information. I am extremely interested in the reasons for her visit, but of course, I will not ask myself. Probably. On the evening of that day, August 2nd, a letter came from Lady Delphine. In short, she prepared some kind of tests for the long-suffering me and was in a hurry to carry them out, making an appointment at the Fortescue Café at 10 in the morning on August 6th. Of course, in a reply letter, I confirmed the receipt of the message and agreed to a meeting, after which I sent it with her own owl. But as soon as I returned to the library, where, on a large free area of the floor, I laid out a bunch of different maps with a rhombus from a potion tracking lupin, I could not help but notice the smooth movement of it in the direction of one well-known place, and this is not the leaky cauldron. Lupin's rhombus moved towards Little Whinging. I've never been there, but I've driven through the adjoining suburb. Thirst for adventure howled like crazy and was already ready to uncover the drill that will pierce the heavens. Quickly gathering myself and dressing in loose black clothes, I threw over one of the black robes with a hood and pulled the second wand out of the cane, simultaneously ridding it of the pommel in the form of a grim I will use this wand. Having conjured on myself every conceivable and inconceivable concealment charm, I quickly left the house and right from the doorway, but already beyond the border of protection, Operat to a gas station in the suburb next to Little Whinging, where John and I stopped a couple of times on the way. I looked around again, and again Operat to the roof, and then to the hill. And so I moved towards the neighboring town, jumping by apparition to the areas I was observing. This is one of the few ways to move in unknown terrain, provided that you have good vision and spatial thinking because you need to clearly visualize yourself in the right place. When I reached Magnolia Crescent near Privet Drive, according to the maps, it was evening, and it was difficult to move without the cat's eye charms because I had to consider the desired place in detail. However, there was no point in moving any further. Once again I cast every conceivable spell of concealment on myself, got to a small hill behind the field, where I had a good view of the privet drive, and conjured a powerful echo, in order to receive responses from objects saturated with magic over a large area as if from a radar. Directions to points and a vague sense of distance to them immediately appeared in my head. Eight wizards move in a group, and about ten are scattered over an area of a couple of square kilometers, which is not much. Jump around this place a couple more times and conjure an echo. 
Do you want to calculate the exact position by the intersection of vectors from three points? Do you have enough power? Don't forget, funny boy, that my way of working and thinking is different from that of a human. You've noticed yourself how quickly you work with numbers and other calculations. But so far, you have only come close to 10% of my capacity. Got it, just a second. Chapter 278 I operat to several other places around this area and conjured an echo several times. When I returned, a clear knowledge of the positions of the wizards appeared in my head. Taking advantage of this knowledge, I cast a spell of the magic mark from the grimoire on static magic objects. The only one I didn't put the mark on was Moody. At least I thought it was Moody, for there was too much magical feedback coming from that object, only this old paranoid can be hung with a bunch of amulets, and his leg is definitely an artifact. I had to repeat the procedure a couple more times noting the wizards who had moved during my previous scans. So what are you up to? Nothing special. Judging by the absence of any change in the patterns of actions and movements, the wizards did not notice my manipulations, which means I can track them. Generally speaking, when comparing conventional weapons and spells, the latter have a very striking disadvantage, speed and range. It's very hard to aim at long distances with a wand, even a hundred meters is a problem. Of course, these disadvantages are mitigated by area-affecting spells, which basically activate in a certain area and affect everything in it. However, the various ray, clot, and other flying constructs are very limited. They are limited by the wizard's thinking capabilities. If you use mental control of the flight of a construct, then you are faced with a similar problem, it is difficult to see and accompany the target at a great distance, simultaneously forcing the construct to bend around obstacles and all that stuff. Even if you know and feel the target's location through different analogs of the dark mark, there are still natural obstacles in the form of landscape, buildings, trees, living creatures, you have to go around them too. In general, hitting something that isn't fairly close and out of the line of sight is no trivial task. Spell speed limits also have rather common roots. You can, of course, simply know which part of the magic construct is responsible for this. Saturate this area with magic without destroying the integrity of the structure, and the construct will fly faster. But for this, you also need to understand which area is responsible for this. To understand constructs in general, you need to feel them. This is already very difficult because you need to develop this very sensitivity. Another method that almost everyone uses to create spells and partially change their properties is imagination. But not everything is smooth here either. To increase the speed of your spells with your imagination, you first have to imagine exactly what it's like to move at the speed you want. Of course, very few wizards and people, in general, have experience moving in space at speeds above 150 miles per hour, and wizards even less, now the ceiling of speed is reached only by one broom, firebolt. This ceiling is 120 miles per hour. One would say, lots of people have flown airplanes, and their speed is high. However, you need to imagine exactly how objects are flying around you, how this speed affects, literally feeling the air resistance with your skin, and many other factors. From here, by the way, and the speed limits in transgression, the wizard simply cannot imagine what it would be like to move very fast. A simple thought is not enough here, I want to fly faster. Why all these thoughts at all I have Rowena? Like me, in the near future, she can accurately track the beacons of wizards, control the flight of spell constructs, simulate various situations from the point of view of physics and perception, take into account a bunch of factors and all this is parallel to one another. I only had to help once, and you've already made a targeting system out of me. But I like the idea itself. Only knowledge about subjects is lacking. And for such a case, wizards have in their arsenal a spell. However, it is rather useless for the average wizard because of the inability to quickly perceive, process, and memorize a three-dimensional map of the area. This is usually used in order to find something specific, and the incoming data array is simply ignored until this specific flickers in mind. Looking around so as not to miss the sudden wizard, I saw only a grove behind and a field in front, behind which the streets of the town were located. Getting down on one knee, put the tip of the wand on the ground, and created the necessary mental image in my head. Locus Science NTIA my magical sensitivity was not enough to detect the fluctuations of magic. Still, I know for sure that the spell began to spread along the ground around me, and the speed of its movement was amazing. 
With the help of Rowena, a detailed three-dimensional map of the area was built in my head, on which absolutely everything that somehow contacted the ground and with each other was displayed. Of course, moving objects disappeared, but static ones remained, grass, curbs, bushes, trees, fences, houses, furniture in them, windows. Everything. Now I could mentally track the movements of the wizards with marks on a three-dimensional map. A silly smile spread across my face. Chapter 279 Don't flatter yourself. The spell is not particularly popular since it is absolutely useless in magically saturated places. I know, but can't I just fantasize and why haven't I done this before because deep down inside, you realize the uselessness of half the tracking devices involved in a magically saturated place. From your memories, I can safely judge that if the worm tail with Mark had gone far enough into the forbidden forest, you could have lost him from the radars. But in the ordinary world, it will work. After thinking this over, I focused on tracking the actions of the wizards. Eight of them entered the Disley's house and began to communicate with Potter, on whom, by the way, I also hung the mark. They chatted there for at least five minutes, after which Potter and another wizard went to the second floor of the house and, apparently, were collecting things. A couple of minutes later, they went down, and a few more minutes later, they went out into the backyard, waiting for something. I wish I could remember what exactly. But not for long, I was in the dark, magical red sparks flew into the sky, and nine wizards lined up in some order. The rest, who were within a radius of half a kilometer from house number four on Privet Drive, remained in their positions for the time being. Another bunch of red sparks, visible only to wizards, began to rise into the air. I raised my wand and instantly gave out the maximum possible density and volume of magic. Stupefy. In a calm atmosphere, without the pressure of someone else's magic and a heap of sources of stress, I managed to create 62 blue clots of stupefy. Rowena immediately took them under her control, and they, like snakes, flew across the field to the streets of the city at a tremendous, at least transonic speed, accelerating more and more. They have no material embodiment the laws of physics, such as aerodynamics and inertia, do not affect them, and therefore they could turn immediately and in any direction. On a three-dimensional map, in my imagination, the marks of a group of wizards quickly blinked along the perimeter of the area around Privet Drive. This is how Rowena signaled that the target was hit without removing the mark. A group of wizards led by Potter managed to put up a slight resistance. Stupefy. Stupefy. I repeated the volley twice. It only took a few seconds for the projectiles to reach their targets. By the time the stupefy beams arrived, five wizards had huddled around Potter and, apparently, set up a powerful protego. Two had already dropped out of the game, and one wizard tried to fly away on a broomstick but was mercilessly shot down and sent to the rose bushes on the Disley plot. The tactics of breaking through protego is quite simple, as with an egg you need to press not from all sides but concentrate the fire at one point. So Rowena did, in flight, lining up three dozen beams one after another, and they broke through the protection, and the rest found targets inside. The wizard with the most magical responses from Echo, presumably Moody, did not last much longer than the rest, it is unlikely that he had previously encountered a swarm of stupefy beams flying at the speed of sound. Suddenly, an owl hooted from the side, which scared me quite a bit I was already tense. The bird was clearly flying towards me, and I put my hand out so that it could sit down. Such a big one, not like any owl. As soon as it sat down, I could see a small, coiled letter that was tied to the bird's leg. After running my wand over the letter and not finding anything unwanted, except for the obvious spell of a standard port kayat, activated on command, I untied it, and the bird immediately flapped its wings and flew away. Curious. I said, unfolding the letter. Mr. Knight, read the beautiful calligraphic handwriting of the unknown sender. I would like to introduce you to people who can turn to you for help in solving various specific issues in magic. To my deepest regret, in the near future, I may be extremely busy, and it will not always be possible for me to contact you personally. Therefore, I consider such a measure necessary. The letter is a port K at activated by a standard command. Sincerely, APWB Dumbledore. Curious. I wanted to watch the paralyzed wizards for a bit so they wouldn't be attacked there or something. But, as you know, the stupefy effect doesn't last very long, and in a dozen minutes, they'll come to their senses on their own. 
just in case, I used attentiveness and other features of the body to the maximum. Porches. I was immediately dragged through by a soft and competently created portal without causing any inconvenience. Chapter 280 Once in a small park grove, I immediately looked around, holding my wand at the ready. Dumbledore sat on a bench, in his usual purple robes, under the light of an ordinary street lamp, next to an overgrown and unkempt tile path. Mr. Knight, the headmaster smiled into his beard, nice evening, isn't it? The feeling of magic made it clear that it was Dumbledore in front of me, and therefore I did not play spies and ask something. Taking off the hood from my head, I removed the concealment and other charms, except for the muggle repelling, allowing Dumbledore not only to look in my direction but also to see myself. You're right, Headmaster. Have a seat, Dumbledore gestured to a seat next to him, and I followed the invitation. There was a silence in which you could clearly hear the noise of the city still not sleeping. I was familiar with this small park literally across the street, right in front of us, there should be an Alfard house, like the one on Grimald, among other brick houses standing close together. Like Grimald Place, this place was neither elite nor even above average. The walls of the brick houses were slightly blackened, and a few glasses in the windows were broken, and clearly, no one had lived there for a long time. While we wait for my, associates, I would like to tell you a little about the situation, Dumbledore began, looking straight ahead. During the last civil war, I gathered concerned wizards willing to oppose the arbitrariness and cruelty of the Dark Lord. I decided to dilute the next pause with my own questions. But shouldn't the Ministry, DMLE, and Auror somehow oppose the illegal actions of the Dark Lord? They should. You're right, the Headmaster nodded. But there are several reasons for their inaction and the inaction of the other wizards. Voldemort. When Dumbledore said the name, I checked the area around for taboo protection. Protected. My actions attracted the headmaster's attention, and he clearly understood their meaning, nodding approvingly. Voldemort has always been cunning and cruel. He attracted people to his side with promises of strength, power, wealth, and permissiveness. He promised the wizards he needed that they would take their rightful place in the world. The greedy went for money, the ideological ones, for an idea. Maniacs and murderers, for permissiveness. Many wealthy families supported Voldemort in one way or another, not only in word and deed but also with money. A wizard is primarily a human being. And human is a vicious creature, Mr. Knight. You can buy a lot for gold. This is what Voldemort did then, bribing various officials and employees of the Ministry of Magic, and this almost completely nullified opposition from the law. A light cool breeze blew as if bringing with it anxiety, and the headmaster, meanwhile, continued his story. Ordinary people are often simply unable to resist anything. Tell me, Mr. Knight, Dumbledore looked at me. You, being raised among the muggles, probably thought, but what is so difficult to pick up a wand and protect yourself there are so many different weapons, methods of defense and attack in the muggle world, and everyone can take it to defend themselves. But answer the question, how many people are really capable of picking up this weapon? how many of them know how to use it, and how many are ready to use it. Phew. Keep the proportion and carry it over to magical England. There you have it, that small number of wizards capable of action. To anyone familiar with the ordinary world, its size, diversity, and population, it would seem ridiculous for one of the opposing sides to have three or four dozen strong wizards, a hundred or two medium, and under five hundred magical creatures and frankly worthless, but embittered and immoral wizards, weak but capable of any vileness. Another gust of wind hinted that the weather could deteriorate at any moment, and the sky was about to be covered with clouds. But the far more serious weapon of Voldemort and his minions is fear. Banal but inescapable for the magical population, the headmaster ran his hand along his grey beard. It is not customary in the wizarding community to kill. Even more so, it is customary to avoid killing. At first and second glance, one may encounter all kinds of unacceptable attitudes toward living human beings and individuals, but not murder. Even in the old days, before the statute, two wizards or families could always find a consensus. Voldemort instilled fear into the hearts and souls of people by the fact that he and his men could kill without any remorse or hesitation. At any moment and anyone, be it a muggle or a wizard. And it doesn't matter for the sake of purpose, interest, or banal entertainment, that was what disarmed wizards the most, the fear of the unthinkable, the unprecedented. 
Fear of Death The Fear of Something That Didn't Happen Before Chapter 288 Exactly, there would have been a massacre. And yet Lupin himself didn't tell anyone what had happened. Didn't notify the headmaster. Although he remembered everything, and all the time, he looked at me guiltily, avoiding me. He didn't talk to me, didn't explain the situation. Didn't share the experience of being such a creature, didn't tell me how to hold back or what measures to take. He just let everything take its course. Very cowardly and selfish, don't you think? Ah! Uh -huh. Nymphadera's mood was not good. So, in general, I was tracking him. Then, on one of his walks, I recorded his movement with a group of wizards. I was bored, so I decided to follow you it was easy. Any average wizard could have done it. Well, what happened next, I told you a non-standard application of ordinary spells multiplied by trained brains. Any sufficiently developed wizard would be able to do it, if not everyone. It was, in fact, the surprise factor and the fact that I was far away and out of your line of sight. But to attack like that. Just stupefy. There were no other wizards around. If someone had been following you, I would have knocked them out. Fine. Nymphadora slammed her palms on her knees. But how did you deal with the lycanthropy don't get me wrong, an infection from a werewolf bite on a full moon is a guarantee of infection in its most severe form. Your method could help many, many people. My method is too unique. It's an extremely energy-intensive, individually calculated ritual. Energy-intensive the nymphadoras look unmistakably hinted at certain peculiarities of energy-intensive rituals. Oh, no, no. I waved away with a smile. No sacrifices, unless you count the almost completely decomposed corpse of the thousand-year-old basilisk that lived in the sewers of Hogwarts. Sirius and Nymphadora looked at me with a completely stupid look for a few seconds, which was quite amusing. What? Well, the Slytherin's basilisk. Judging by its size, it's lived about a thousand years. Give or take fifty years. The table of the dependence of size on age is the same for all types of basilisks. But... How Nymphadora jumped up from her chair and began to pace up and down the room. That's... Wow. All this time. Such a dangerous creature lived there. You're not lying. I'm serious. Harry and I killed it in the second year, saving Ginny. You'd better ask Harry for the details, I was dragged into this at the very end and events were gathering momentum for almost the whole year, and Harry was somehow involved there. Nymphadora paced the room for a few more minutes, thinking. Sirius sat thoughtful and shocked, but I can't guess what he was thinking about. It turns out, Nymphadora stopped. Did you decompose the basilisk into magic for the ritual but this is a huge amount of magic? Where to, do you know about the triad of being? MMMM. No. Sirius stirred. The result of dark magical research on the soul by wizards of the Middle Ages, Black said in a low voice, looking at the floor. Research may be darkly magical, the process of which I did not approve, leafing through the ancient parchments, but the results are very ordinary, useful, and opening eyes to some of the secrets and processes of the universe. Nothing is clear, Nymphadora shook her head, and it's not clear how it helped you. I reconstructed the body based on information from the soul. Something like that. What? Nymphadora's eyes bulged amusedly, and Sirius nodded importantly, as if for him such things are commonplace, like breakfast in the morning. What part of my sentence escapes your understanding? All of it. All parts of the sentence. How is that even and don't tell me it's normal? Nymphadora was surprised and outraged, but you can't blame her. Well, all the information is in the Hogwarts library. There's lots and lots of different information out there in general, the level of which ranges from the most basic knowledge to those that far surpass the masters. You just have to be able to read, have the desire to understand, learn about the world in a variety of ways, and be able to count, if possible, quickly. That's nonsense. Nymphadora sat down on a chair. I actually went to Hogwarts, too. I've never seen anything like it. Well, no one will provide you such unique knowledge in its pure form and by a happy coincidence, suitable for your situation. At that time, I looked through a third of the library, and to achieve the result, I had to use almost all the knowledge available in my head while calculating the ritual scheme from scratch. I didn't even have much of choice. 
remain a werewolf. Undergo treatment and for four days a month become magically, physically, and mentally disabled, but safe. Brew an expensive potion every month while still remaining a werewolf capable of infecting other people. And this option, to risk everything but be cured. But. Nymphadora spread her hands to the sides with incomprehension, looking at me. Where do you get such ideas from to use almost basic spells this way? Even that ritual. You haven't read muggle fiction. There are far more ambitious ideas than mine. All that remains is to adjust the magic to the fantasy. Everything is here, I tapped my temple with a finger. Chapter 289 Well, are you cured? I don't know, I shrugged, causing Nymphadora and Sirius to look even more surprised. How is that black looked at me blankly? There are some consequences remained, it seems, because of the basilisk carcass as a source of energy but no loss of control and transformations. According to calculations, it turns out that I am not contagious either, and the result just changed my nature a little. What about the headmaster it must be a dark ritual. What's so dark about it dark magic is magic whose only meaning and essence is to cause harm. According to the ministry's classification, there's a whole coven of dark wizards around here. It's called Mungo. And that's where they heal people. The door opened, and Andromeda in her bright yellow robe, walked into the room, immediately closing the door in front of the four redheads and one black-haired boy. Mrs. Tonks, I nodded in greeting. Mom! jumped Nymphadora. Here! The girl pointed her hand at Lupin lying in bed. I'm not blind, Dora! Max! She nodded to me and then to Sirius. Then she walked over to the bed and took her wand out of the depths of her robe, and began to move it around Lupin's head. After a dozen seconds, Andromeda cast a couple of wound healing and tissue restoring spells and a couple more unknown to me. That's it. Injuries are minor thanks to timely assistance, Mrs. Tonks summarized. Give him Skelgiaro six drops per glass of water, and the damaged bones in his skull will recover. A simple Wigan Weld potion, coupled with his increased regeneration, will restore the rest. Andromeda stepped away from the bed and looked at me. I wrote you letters, I smiled wanting to see the reaction. Don't get me wrong, she smiled back. We are all connected with the order in one way or another. We all avoided any outside contact in any way until a fully protected shelter was finally established. A reliable means of communication will appear in a couple of days, and we thought to answer you just then. To be sure that neither the message nor the addressee could be intercepted. We contacted ourselves with the help of fox and two special breeds of owls. We don't know. Nymphadora took the floor. Even with information from their side, what exactly Voldemort will do? Yes, and I wrote to you right after the start of the holidays, but the owl flew back. It looks like Kriaker took my instruction too literally to lock himself up in the house on Grimald. I see. Okay. Anyway, I got up from my chair, I should mind my own business, too. Max. Jumped from Nymphadora's chair. You wanted to see what the order is capable of. Let's say, I turned around at the door. Would you like a little sparring there is a dual hall, the girl smiled predatorily. Sirius was paying all his attention to worrying about Lupin, and Andromeda just shook her head dejectedly. Don't confuse a fight with a duel, Nymphadora, but I agree. Lead on. And don't call me Nymphadora, she remembered suddenly, heading for the door and opening it. Follow me. Outside the door, as before, the redheads and Potter were waiting. What's going on Harry asked the question immediately. Yo, Max. The twins nodded in sync, smiling, and Ron's place was taken by Bill, who had recently shown up here in a business suit but still wearing the same dragon skin boots. He didn't say hello, but he looked at me in surprise. Lupin got shot, but it's all right, said Nymphadora, and we have a duel. Hmm grunted Bill, and if Potter headed into the room, then the twins, who had been silent for the time being, Ginny and Bill followed us. A duel Ginny spoke up. How serious is it? We'll just test each other's strength. Yeah okay, then. The girl turned toward the stairs. The twins looked at each other. We'll go check on the marauder, too, then. The boys headed back to the room where Lupin was resting. We went down to the first level of the basement, 
where we walked literally a couple of meters down a gloomy stone hallway to a large wooden double door. Come in, Nymphadora pushed the door open, and we found ourselves in a spacious and simple stone hall with high ceilings. The room was divided into two sections. The smaller one, closer to the entrance, had sofas, a table, and a couple of narrow and tall bookcases. A much larger part was completely empty. There was nothing to look at except the bare stone walls and floor. Even the light here was the same as in the Chamber of Secrets, it is not clear where it comes from, but good enough both for reading and fighting. So, Nymphadora turned sharply, putting her hands on her hips. Max and I go there. The girl nodded toward a large, empty part of the room. And you're here, she added for Bill. Unbeknownst to us, Andromeda appeared here, all in the same yellow robe. If anything happens, I'll put your arms and legs back in place. Bill grunted once again. I took off my robe, remaining in a casual black suit of pants, high toe boots, and a hoodie. Restrictions. No unforgivable and dark spells. It's a duel, Max. All right. Chapter 290 We stepped apart to either side of the empty half of the hall, and Andromeda, coming to the edge of this zone, raised her wand into the air, creating a kind of barrier between the two parts of the room. Just like at home. She said faintly, and a logical question arose in my mind, where on Grimald is the same hall I've seen the other one? I'll have to ask Kriaker. On the count of three. Three, two, one. Without noticing how the wand was in my hand, I caught a ray of nonverbal stupefy on its tip, sending it back together with a thick blue reducto beam. Nymphadora simply bounced off the trajectory of both rays, throwing in Carceris and hiding behind a flying ball of threads the materialized essence of the spell, a couple of transparent nonverbal ictus, air fists. Incarcero can mislead a wizard accustomed to transfiguration reverse transfiguration charms or shields from material attacks do not work on these ropes since they are not actually real. It is also difficult to dodge because, in flight, they open up like fishing nets, and as soon as they touch the target, even with the very tip, the whole spell immediately hits the target. These thoughts flashed instantly, and I simply operate with black smoke two steps to the side. The semi-transparent clots followed me and I again took them on pro-to-go duo with the tip of my wand, sending them back together with the reducto rays. Nymphadora dodged to the side in the white smoke of transgression but a couple of steps further. I had to go into a transgression again, simultaneously throwing Bomarda into the floor in front of her, forcing her to go into a transgression as well. We circled around the hall in a wild and fast dance of black and white smoke, keeping our distance throwing spells at each other that are not particularly dangerous but painful or disabling in case of a hit. Along the way, we tried to create obstacles and difficulties for each other. I used transfiguration, forcing Nymphadora into transgression from various dangerous objects, small and not so small, and then tried to catch her with energy spells that could pass through the transfiguration field of space. On the other hand, Nymphadora was ruining the local landscape with bomb artists following my first example, forcing me to move in transgression from the shards as well. Although, by doing so, she created material for me to transfigure. After 20 seconds of combat, several things became clear. I forcibly slowed myself down to the level of perception and reaction of an ordinary person, this is not enough to quickly defeat a rather talented, judging by the reviews, junior Auror. Obviously, I'm pushing her slowly, the speed of the fight is gradually decreasing. However, we don't use overtly combat spells. Having decided to speed up a little, I began to create stupefy saturated with magic, sending five or six beams into a white fog, in which the figure of a Nymphadora could sometimes be seen. It was at this moment that Nymphadora sped up abruptly, almost immediately being next to me. She decided to enter a kind of clinch, using the fact that I was distracted by the concentration of oversaturation of stupefy with magic a powerful stupefy almost escaped the girl's wand but I raised the speed to the level of Nymphadora and used one of Delphine's tricks, oversaturated with magic reducto from the transgression. It creates the effect of a powerful shock wave. True, there are a couple more ways, but here you need to get out of the transgression the transfiguration of space distorts some of the effects of spells. Nymphadora flew out of the transgression like a cork from a bottle, hitting her back against the nearest wall and falling on one knee, put her hand to her head. Expel your miss. Incarceres. A dim ray of the first spell disarmed Nymphadora, 
and the second bound her tightly and qualitatively. Hmm, you can accelerate not bad. Mordred. Nymphadora said dejectedly, lying tied up on the floor and wincing a little from the pain in her head. Well, almost. You shouldn't be able to accelerate. I shouldn't be able to use transgression either. What made you believe that you know my limits it is better to overestimate the enemy and win? Having dispelled the binding spell, I helped Nymphadora to stand up and return the wand. It was a pretty smart decision to catch me concentrating while I was oversaturating my spell. I would have done it myself if I was sure that the enemy could not accelerate. Yet. I lost to a schoolboy. Well done, Max, Nymphadora poked me in the shoulder with her fist. Chapter 291 Hey! Fight me now, Bill came up to us, defeating a girl is not a lot of honor. Hey! I'm actually an auror. Nymphadora was indignant but left the dual zone, falling into the tenacious diagnostic hands of her mother. Fortunately, the diagnosis was completed in less than half a minute, and the countdown began again. 3, 2, 1. At maximum mental and physical acceleration, with a sharp and careless but very quick wave of the wand, I created as fast a single nonverbal stupefy as I could. It instantly hit Bill, who did not have time to put Protego right in the stomach. The guy flew into the wall with the speed of a bullet and fell. Andromeda announced my victory and came to diagnose Bill. He's okay. Just stupefy and hit the wall a little, she stated and looked at the wall. They won't let you crash here. Okay, I really have to go. It's already night. Nodding goodbye to everyone present, I headed for the exit. I'll walk you out. Nymphadora jumped up from her comfortable chair, and together we left the room. When we reached the first floor, Nymphadora looked at me. Someone is teaching you, right I realized this from that wave such nuances are not written in textbooks, as well as methods of going into transgression. Yes. Who? I won't tell you. Already at the door of the house, Nymphadora turned to me again. Come back in a couple of days. We should have a reliable means of communication by this time. If I have time. Nodding, I cast a muggle-repelling charm on myself and left the house, immediately operating into one of the dark alleys on Grimwald Place. The sixth of the month, on the morning of which the appointment with Lady Greengrass was scheduled, came very quickly. I took full advantage of those free days in early August, almost locking myself in the Grimwald's gym, leaving it only to sleep and eat. What did I do I experimented with Hemomancy, long overdue. A truly secret place, the house on Grimwald, was now at my complete disposal. I could have done it last summer, but I was too excited about the idea of an apprenticeship, and this July, I spent in the library. But, if the meeting with Lady Greengrass and her brilliant ideas do not take too much time, I will definitely spend August here. I found out about my own Hemomancy, not so much new, but there was something. Experiments with purchased animals have shown that I can only influence myself and the blood I create. Experiments with created blood showed that it is not real. It is rather a kind of material manifestation of energy, just like ropes of incarcerous spell. They are there, but they do not obey the influence as on matter. Oh, but how much it would simplify the search for material for the transfiguration because it is much more difficult to make something out of the air than out of dense matter. I have had an understanding of my hemomantic abilities for a long time. More precisely, just guesswork because these abilities did not intersect with magic. However, I still believed that they were sort of separate abilities, strengthening or weakening the body and creating blood. Perhaps my delusions were indulged by the behavior of the created blood it obeyed the laws of physics as a liquid, so it was perceived as a liquid. Now, when I perceived the hemomancy as manipulation of some energy, incredible possibilities opened up before me. Though, I don't see them. The thing is that judging from my manipulations, other beings don't have this energy in them, so I can't manipulate it either. Attempts to use it instead of magic when creating spells did not lead to anything well, I create a construct from this energy, so what nothing happens, and with sufficient saturation, the bloody structure of the magic construct simply appears in the air as if mocking me. Mixing this energy with magic while creating constructs in amounts tangible but not enough to form blood led to, well, led to something because this energy flew away together with the construct, but I did not find any tangible difference or change in the effects of the spells. However, in the materialized, bloody state, 
This energy can easily break physical objects, destroy them. It can destroy even magical bonds and constructs, but then again, I knew that. Another important observation was the increase in the degree of control of hemomancy and the amount of materialized energy as control and sensitivity to magic increased. There is a logical explanation for this both are some kind of energy with similar principles of managing them. Well, I am still growing and developing, growing up, gaining experience, which inevitably leads to an improvement in qualitative and quantitative indicators in working with energy. All in all, on the one hand, I have learned a lot, and on the other hand, nothing. The most frustrating part is that I simply have nowhere to get literature or a mentor on how to work with hemomancy. It looks like I'll have to learn everything from personal experience and experimentation, just like the ancient wizards, and hope it doesn't kill me. Although, I know at least one application, processing materials at any conceivable degree of purity, cutting out ideal ritual schemes with it, and so on. And also, importantly, materialized energy in the form of blood is an excellent conductor of magic. Chapter 292 I didn't find out anything else during the three days of training at the house on Grimald. On the morning of the sixth day, I was already dressed in a brand new black business suit, a three-piece with a rare vertical stripe. A coat over it, a muffler, a wand in a holster, the second in a cane. Behind my shoulder is the invariable bag with an extension charm on it, in which I carry all my belongings I spent two hours to put everything in order and sort everything into its places. I put a muggle repellent spell on myself and left the Grimwald house, but as soon as I was out the door, a clearly disgruntled owl flew up, defiantly dropped the letter, and flew away, hooting furiously. I intercepted the letter with my telekinesis, and after checking for surprises, I opened it, from Hogwarts. A list of everything I needed. Shouldn't they have been sent out earlier or did Kriaker again decide to close the house from seemingly necessary but not mandatory correspondence but Hermione's letters come without problems, even if they do not come often? I'll have to talk to him about this. I put the letter in the inside pocket of my coat and operat to the leaky cauldron. Having entered the pub, I expected to plunge into the unpleasant atmosphere created by the regulars again. However, in fairness, it should be noted that, frankly, Homeless characters were not observed here today. To some extent gloomy, yes. And in general, it somehow became cleaner, and the smells of something mushroom with vegetables and spices were quite pleasant. Like the appearance of other wizards, my appearance attracted a little attention, but just enough so that the locals did not recognize their acquaintance in me and continued to go about their business, drinking, eating, reading books. Oh, what Hawking spoke without any trouble from the bartender who obviously recognized me, I made my way to a dead end in the backyard and tapped my wand in the right places to open the passage. Life on Diagon Alley was just getting into its normal course, there were almost no wizards always scurrying back and forth, some shops had just opened, and some were still closed. On the walls of some of the shops, there were wanted lists of prisoners who had escaped from Azkaban, but they were not looked at as if they were fascinated by the diversion of the eyes. Careless Wizards since I found myself on Diagon Alley, it would be logical to buy everything for the upcoming school year, especially since the main stores are already open. Moreover, time permits. Without queues and crowds, having managed to do my shopping in just half an hour, I stood at the Fortescue Cafe, enjoying the taste of just-bought ice cream with chocolate chips and watching the wizards gradually arriving on the alley. Exactly at the appointed time, I noticed in the crowd the familiar figure of Lady Greengrass in a black fitted coat and a hood, from under which only the lower half of her face was visible. However, this and the peculiarities of movement with gait were more than enough for me to recognize her. Approaching me, Delphine slightly lifted her hood, letting me see her face, and at such a distance, I could easily feel her magic, it's her. Hello, she smiled politely and held out her hand, but not for a polite greeting. We're leaving now with the port at Nodding, I took her hand, and we were immediately pulled into a soft portal, and a moment later, we were standing in a small clearing next to her Norwegian-style wooden house. Still, what a huge difference it makes in the air when you are surrounded by woods. We walked into the house in silence, and it was only during the tea party in the great central room, sitting at the table in the chairs across from each other, that at least some conversation broke out. I'll be brief. Lady Greengrass spoke in a serious tone, looking at me. The program for the next couple of days is simple. First, 
will decide on training, schedules, and other things. After a couple of days, through a ritual and a potion, we will reveal the effects of your lycanthropy treatment. As I understand it, something is left, and the form of this something is unknown. Exactly. After that, you'll have to study on your own for a while. I'll give you all the materials, instructions, and the work of other Transfiguration Masters, so you can orient yourself on a future project, you can start now. Nodding, I reached for a simple raisin cookie. Now, over the next few days, we'll go over the basics of these works. The rest is up to you. Questions Why so little time and how will the learning take place during school hours? Time is short because now everyone has little time. The rebirth of the Dark Lord is an extraordinary event. All the rich, powerful, or influential. Or all in one. Everyone now has an unthinkable number of problems and worries that need to be solved, as usual, yesterday. Supporters are recruited, old ties are restored, voluntarily or forcibly, it doesn't matter. I've already thought about classes. Will it be a problem for you to get out to Hogsmeade once a week? I don't think it would be a problem. There are plenty of secret passages at Hogwarts. Then that's what we'll do, Delphine nodded. Chapter 293 Immediately after tea, we began sorting through a huge pile of copies of handwritten parchments and folios that contained the works of various Transfiguration Masters for which they had been awarded titles. At this point, according to Lady Greengrass, I have mastered the Transfiguration base fairly well. Now it's just a matter of practice to improve skills and increase strength so that there is enough for the exam program for the master's degree. To test these very powers, we used information from five exams from the previous years. As I was told earlier, they required a series of transfigurations of a certain complexity in the allotted period of time. I completed the certification program for the Master of Transfiguration by three quarters if I did not strengthen myself in any way and did not use Hermione's spell, resonance from the second wand. But at nightfall, I decided to check how the addition of hemomancy energy to transfiguration spells would affect, whether I could meet the standard, thereby compensating for the insufficient density of magic. Strangely enough, there was an effect, and if I added hemomancy energy in a reasonable amount, avoiding the formation of bloody magical circuits, then the certification program met the deadline. If I concentrated enough, thereby connecting Rowena's computing power to the process, the program was even easier. Back at the beginning of the summer, I was only doing the apprentice program, but there I was weakening myself to the level of an ordinary person. Such progress made me wonder if Hemomancy and Rowena could be considered part of my abilities. I mean, isn't using them a kind of, cheating before going to bed, I ran this thought in my head and came to the unequivocal conclusion that it isn't. It's as much a part of me as my arms, legs, magic, etc. After all, the masters of Chimerology, who are engaged in improving their bodies, do not ask such questions so it is here. On the second and third days of my stay in Lady Greengrass's house, we were engaged in an analysis of the directions of transfiguration, in which it would be interesting and useful to write a couple of scientific articles necessary for defending a master degree. In the end, it was decided to write about combined transfiguration from living to non-living and living at the same time. The topic of such combining is completely unexplored, and my experiments and calculations where I combined organics and inorganics, transfiguring myself, would be very helpful in such a thing. Of course, if you do not know the question, then such a topic will seem stupid because incomplete transfigurations from living to non-living, or when a mistake is made, are very similar. For example, the same Ron and Harry more than once in class made small mistakes. Their living subjects were transformed into all sorts of utensils, but not completely, soft woolen and squeaking glasses, chitinous buttons on legs, thorny boxes made of hedgehogs. But this is completely different because, in fact, there simply changes the shape. Simply put, if you cut open a squeaky woolen glass, you will see organs and bones inside. For this reason, McGonagall categorically prohibits applying transfiguration to people and even pointing a wand at them, for this in her classes, you can get the dirtiest and vilest detentions until the end of the year. The whole fourth day, we were preparing for the ritual, but even so, I noticed a certain concern of Lady Greengrass for several days, and even when she was carried away with preparing the potion, she looked somehow wrong. Closer to the evening, the large and spacious ritual hall on the second basement level was prepared, 
with a rather complicated scheme carved by magic on its floor. Understandable and, in my opinion, quite safe. The cauldron with the potion was moved here, and it had to brew for about twenty minutes more. I was only in a robe and underwear in case of transformation, the shape of which differs in size, it's a pity for the clothes. Of course, only the head was not covered with cloth. It's not the first day that something has been bothering you very much, I spoke in a flat voice to Lady Greengrass, who was looking thoughtfully at the potion in the cauldron. Delphine looked up at me and was silent for a dozen seconds. There are a few minor problems. Of a personal nature. Don't worry about it. With a shrug, I continued to study the ritual scheme, analyzing and memorizing interesting solutions in the rune chains. Perhaps something similar might be useful to me in the future. When the potion was infused, Lady Greengrass used a scoop to fill a medium-sized cup with it and handed it to me. The procedure is as follows, Max. You drink the potion, stand in the center. You don't need to do anything else. If we achieve the desired effect and the transformation occurs, it will last 8 to 10 minutes. The ritual will be isolated inside, and if you lose yourself during the transformation, as a werewolf should, you won't be able to get out. In turn, I will collect all the data, and then we can analyze and understand the depth of the consequences to which your own research has led you. Questions Is there any chance that the transformation is final? Absolutely not, Delphine shook her head. Any transformation requires certain conditions to be met. For werewolves, it's a full moon. It was under the light of the moon that you noticed the change if I remember correctly. Yes. So the full moon is one of the factors. Now is the new moon, and at least this factor is not met. When the energy from the forced transformation runs out, the factor that is not met will cancel the transformation. If it happens at all. Chapter 294 I see, I scrolled through the theoretical possibilities gained from the basilisk, the dragon and the hemomancy in my head. But, if anything, run away. I will be very sad if I lose such a teacher, you explain the material well, the pay is symbolic, and also a joy for the eyes. Even an inappropriate compliment can be pleasant, Delphine smiled sparingly but sincerely. Drink already. Do you always hide the slight excitement behind inappropriate remarks imagine how it looks from the outside, a nearly naked teenager in a robe complimenting a woman who's old enough to be his mother. My only excuse is that Lady Greengrass is really beautiful and looks young. The analysis of neuroactivity revealed a slightly increased level of arousal. Ache tongue. Alarm. Calm down, schizophrenia. I'm driven by curiosity, and the specifics of our symbiosis are such that I'm here as an observer, which gets absolutely all the data from your body if you know what I mean. Where did such a manner of speaking come from the constant exchange of data with your mind, subconscious, and memory imposes certain imprints? Having drained a glass of potion in one gulp, which tasted pleasant in contrast to Skelgiaro, I returned the empty glass to Lady Greengrass and went exactly to the center of the ritual scheme. True, it was not difficult, there is a big empty circle, it's hard to miss. Ready? I don't think so. Well, don't worry. Muggles say nerve cells don't regenerate. Lady Greengrass waved her wand, and the ritual diagram under my feet glowed softly blue. As she did so, a translucent dome of protection closed over me. From Lady Greengrass's wand, blue clots were constantly breaking off, soaking into the defense and strengthening it. Fian to Duri. I couldn't hear the words, but I could read lips. An unusual warmth began to spread through the body, and the magic inside seemed to go berserk, starting to be generated at a frantic pace, immediately consuming it for something. Hemomancy behaved similarly. I am recording strange data. Skipper. We have problems. Rowena's mental voice came as if through a thick layer of water. Too done. A pulse was pounding in my head. Too done. As if a shock had been sent through the nerves. Too doom. Consciousness shattered like glass. The consciousness that self-identifies as Rowena watched with great interest as Max's mind seemed to split, but it wasn't really. It was no secret to Rowena that the spirited weapon could absorb souls, unknowingly transforming them. Of course, the very essence of the soul went to unknown distances, but the rest remained. At this moment, the situation could be imagined as if Max's mind consisted of a multitude of tiny particles that flew away to the most related spiritual structures. 
It was certainly an interesting experience, but Rowena understood that without help, it would take him an unknown amount of time to get back together. At the same time, she noted the fact that the transformation launched by the ritual and the potion requires much more resources and energy than both the ritual itself and Max himself can give. The problem was seemingly insignificant, and the ritual would have worked as it should, except that after rebirth, the body had one of the many undocumented functions, the absorption of energy like the sword. Because of this, the possibility of turning off the transformation process seems somewhat impossible, the body would be autonomously searching for energy. Of course, even if this were not the case, Rowena would have provided all possible help to put this puzzle back together. Determined to properly document every detail for a future report, Rowena set to work, began to put Max's mind back together, speeding up his natural recovery. 161, Chapter 295 From the first seconds of the ritual, Delphine noticed that it was not going according to plan. But all factors had been taken into account. However, now, in the center of the working scheme, surrounded by a hemisphere of an impenetrable and fortified dome of protection, there is a young guy in a tightly wrapped robe. Someone else would say that everything is fine. Standing in Merlin with him. But the data from the ritual, received through the mental block, clearly made it clear to the master of chimerology that something in the body of her student was going wrong, devouring magic in huge quantities. A brief moment and the guy's gaze acquired a certain meaning, the pupils became vertical, and the iris glowed faintly blue. Interesting. Delphine held a wand in her hand and prepared for any surprise. Max jerked his head in a sharp, broken motion and looked at Lady Greengrass. For a brief moment, the boy's silhouette blurred, and now he was standing exactly in front of the protective dome, pointing the finger at it. Circles spread across the dome as if on water, but this protection was too good to collapse from a mere touch. Eight minutes. Muttered Lady Greengrass, keeping her eyes on the boy in the tightly wrapped robe. And there's nothing clear. Suddenly, a thin, thin red vertical line appeared from where the dome made contact with the guy's finger, and in the next instant, that line literally pulled the defenses apart, forming a passageway. On reflexes alone, Delphine sent a series of nonverbal paralyzing and stunning charms at the guy, but the guy carelessly and lazily ducked, following the beams with a glance and again looking at the woman with a blank look. With a sharp blurred motion, he jerked his head. Another series of spells with a white cone broke off from the tip of Delphine's wand, but even her perception improved with the help of Chimerology failed in an attempt to catch the speed of the guy's movements, which was already very close. Without thinking, Lady Greengrass operat outside the hall will now be sealed. For a while. A sense of strange magic forced Delphine to turn around as soon as she was outside the house. It was evening. In the west, the sky was red with the light of the setting sun. Even before the deformation of space from the apparition really disappeared, this funnel seemed to be turned back, revealing the figure of a guy who was still looking with dimly glowing blue eyes. Delphine tried to evade such intrusive pursuit at a maximum acceleration of mind and body, literally scattering magical trap constructs behind her and transfiguring space while instantly operating from the coordinates of her surroundings that popped up randomly in her mind. Even for her perception, the pictures of the terrain were changing too fast. Still, to the woman's surprise, Max didn't lag behind for a moment, nonchalantly passing through obstacles, unraveling complex constructs, reversing the transfiguration. The only thing that stopped Lady Greengrass from using Avada was that the data was still coming through the ritual's mental block, and Max was closing the distance not so fast, which means that soon the effect of the ritual and the potion would go backwards. A minute, two, five. Perhaps never before had Lady Greengrass had to give her best so much as to simply delay a pursuer. Everything was used, except for frankly lethal means, but Max, in passing, without gestures, or words, just looking at the spell I was casting, literally took it apart. Does he see magic? A ridiculous guess flashed through the woman's head, but such conclusions suggested themselves. And it was incredible. The thought that captured the woman for a short time knocked her concentration, and that was enough for Max to be able to get closer. Delphine already wanted to apparate, but with just one touch, the guy inflicted some kind of magical blow, spell, or charms. Chapter 296 Lady Greengrass literally flew out of the apparition funnel, rolling along the edge of the forest and crashing into a tree with her back. Nothing serious, not with her body modification. 
but again, these mere fractions of a second allowed Max, who emerged from the funnel of the apparition, to be there immediately, and with another tap on her shoulder, to take away the woman's ability to move. Leaning over Delphine, lying on her back in her casual leather suit, Max moved his hand over her, touching her with his index finger in seemingly random places. It was as if he was touching an unknown animal. The thought seemed absurd, and contrary to the situation, would have made Delphine laugh if she could have laughed. On the other hand, Max's gaze was not funny, it was blank, and it was as if he were looking through a woman. After trying to cast a couple of wandless cancelling charms, Lady Greengrass realized the depth of the danger of the situation, the magic did not work. More precisely, it didn't obey her. Attempts were in vain, and after listening for a moment to the sensations of her own magic, Delphine was even more surprised, in the places where Max touched her with his finger, the magic began some wild, unknown dance, spending itself on, on something. Ha as. A real snake whisper came to the woman's ear from the guy's mouth. Shia SSS. The guy jerked his head sharply, tilting it to the side, and instead of a hiss, he growled a couple of times, again staring somewhere deep into the woman's body. And anxiety grew into fear. The only thing that saved her from panic was the countdown in Lady Greengrass's head a couple of seconds until the end of the ritual and the potion. But these seconds passed, and Max was still engaged in the same, incomprehensible, and making some changes in her body, actions, quiet whispering from his lips now and then was replaced by growls, sometimes quite different in intonation, and a couple of times even quite understandable words and phrases burst out, do not eat, cultivate, then tastier, do not spoil your own garden, drink, well, at least try. The uncertainty and fear made her heart beat at breakneck speed. In addition to the disobedient magic and the inability to move at least a finger, some tension grew in the body, which tingled throughout the nervous system. Thoughts jumped from one to the other, but one stood out brightly, if I survive, someone will get a beating. It's not his fault, yes, but it doesn't matter. Another series of hisses and growls ended with, just a little bit. Much to Delphine's shock, Max put one hand under the back of her head and lifted her off the ground. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw his fangs, and the picture gained certain integrity, right now, she would be drunk or poisoned. And nothing can be done. The phrase just a little bit inspired hope and then the opportunity to recoup properly. However, the situation changed again. Max jerked his head sharply, put the woman back on the ground, and rose to his full height. Once again, he broke into a series of hisses and growls. As if arguing with himself. He looked somewhere in the distance, toward the sunset. Only under disguise. He said in English, and his robe turned to black smoke, changing its outline to a dense black suit and already another hooded robe. Passing a black gloved hand in front of his face, the guy created impenetrable darkness under the hood and disappeared into a whirlwind of apparition. Delphine felt incredible relief, along with the deepest disappointment. I've never been so neglected before. Gradually calming down and looking at the slowly darkening evening sky, Lady Greengrass, who was not at all aristocratically lying motionless as a doll at the edge of the forest under a tree, tried to regain her body's mobility. Not without success. All it takes is time. Chapter 297 Severus Snape hated this day. He hated it like so many others in his life. In recent days, due to orders, requests, and other polite appeals, obliging him to voluntarily and compulsorily engage in the affairs of two influential wizards with exaggerated self-esteem, he was deprived of sleep, rest, and other needs so necessary for a living person. Moreover, this insane combat unit, better known as Bella, decided that her company was vital for him today. And why because tonight is the night, Severus has to go to the Nocturne Alley to pick up ingredients and other supplies for the Lord. It was the night when the crazy bitch got tired of pestering everyone else and periodically running away in an unknown direction. It was that night she realized how wretched her nephew was as a wizard, and trying to teach him anything at all would only drive Draco to his grave. However, this will not upset anyone except Narcissa. Why is Maximilian an outstanding wizard and Draco a caricatured parody of him is the Malfoy blood so? Severus, Severus. Bella sang in a hoarse chest voice wrapped in black clothes and a hooded robe. Look what a squalor there is. She walked lightly as if she hadn't been in Azkaban for almost 14 years. However, if you apply diagnostic charms, 
then your eyes will pop out of their sockets in amazement and move to the back of your head, to a permanent place of residence it's easier to say what problems she does not have. However, they are all like that. The good thing is that at least they have not become weaker in terms of magical powers. That's not why we're here, Snape calmly tried to stop the witch. We should come and get some, we shouldn't kill everyone, Bella. The crazy lady still decided to try out some kind of curse on the unfortunate man and has already pulled out her wand. Sev, why don't you throw one curse at him, and I'll throw another and see what happens. We don't have time for that, Snape said quietly without turning around, moving on through the narrow, dark alleys of Nocturne. It was surprising how their appearance frightened away the local regulars. Severus. Bella's voice changed abruptly from playful to demanding. Don't you dare leave me alone with my whims. The click of her heels on the stone-paved alley made it clear to Severus that Bella decided to keep up and caught up with him. Together, turning another corner and finding himself almost in complete darkness from the closely standing unkempt stone houses, Severus sensed something was wrong and pushed Bella behind his back with his hand while stepping into a small niche in the wall. Hands! exclaimed Bella indignantly, but Snape only gestured, silence. Attention! Danger. They pulled out their wands in sync, and just at that moment, two dozen yards away, further down the alley, the stone wall of the house shattered as if from an explosion, and along with crumbs, dust, and large chunks of stone, the body of a wizard in dirty clothes flew out into the street. The light from the formed opening pulled out of the darkness a very quickly moving black figure in a robe, which immediately appeared next to the unfortunate man and grabbed him by the chest with one hand, lifted him into the air. Nu cried the wretched man. His skin began to crack, and a dim red light pierced through those cracks. Severus recognized him, it was he and a group of the same bastards who supplied human internal organs for experiments. Humans and non-humans. They were werewolves themselves, but that made little difference. The red light escaping from under the cracks in the unfortunate man's skin seemed to turn into trickles of liquid, quickly flowing to where the mouth should have been under the impenetrable blackness of the hood of the figure holding him. Another figure in rags ran out of the opening in the wall the accomplice of the werewolf that was drying up in the grip of the unknown and began to crumble into ashes, scattering in a non-existent wind. The accomplice tried to escape but absurdly stumbled over the fragments of the wall. He didn't see that the figure in black had already finished eating and paid attention to him, waving his hand. The unfortunate man was literally knocked into the stone road and, for a brief moment, he saw Severus and Bella. Run, you fools! Obeying the gesture of the black-clad unknown's hand, the second unfortunate man instantly flew into the air and found himself in the unknown man's death grip. Severus logically assumed the same fate awaited him. Let's go, he whispered quietly to Bella, who was fascinated by what was happening. Without waiting for a reaction, Snape was about to leave the crazy bitch here, but imagining the punishment from the Lord, he changed his mind, grabbed her by the arm, and dragged her away from the alley. They had only walked a dozen yards before the figure of the unknown man in black appeared in front of them. Snape's reaction wasn't bad, and the first thing that came to mind was. Avada Kedavra, Severus breathed out the spell in a calm voice, pointing his wand at the unknown, but he dodged the almost close-fitting Avada in a smooth motion. Bella swung her wand, but suddenly the wand slipped out of her hands, as well as out of Snape's. Neither Severus nor Bella saw the figure move before they were paralyzed by its mere touch. The unknown man leaned slightly over the frozen woman's face and froze as if examining. You look worse than a muggle bum. The unknown man spoke in a deadpan voice. Not only to kill, even to stand next to you is disgusting. With a sudden twitch of his hood, the stranger hissed in parcel tongue and operat de way. Snape and Bella stood in a daze for a few more moments, but it passed quickly. What the hell? Bella screamed, beckoning her wand from the pavement with a gesture. That's me. That's with me. Crazy. What is she thinking in this situation resented Snape in his mind, thinking in passing, why not actually take the Lord's order from the dead criminals better than Cruciatus, anyway. Chapter 298 The starry sky did not please Delphine at all, though she loved the stars. She had almost managed to regain mobility, but the magic was still not responding, going to the unknown needs of her body. Just as Delphine was about to regain mobility in her arms and could barely move her eyes and head, a man in black appeared from the apparition funnel nearby. He quickly walked over and took off his hood, 
Max. But contrary to the woman's fears, his eyes were quite sane, though his iris continued to glow dimly blue. The boy picked her up quickly and gently in his arms and operat, to the woman's surprise, quite gently. Once in the main hall of her country cottage in the woods, the guy gently laid her down on the couch. I owe you an apology. I'm fine now, and I'm in control of myself. I have no idea what exactly I did while in that state, but I know one thing, you need to get some sleep. You'll definitely recover by morning. After leaving for a minute, the guy brought a blanket and carefully covered Delphine. That was awkward. Yet. Yeah. You don't know how to apologize. In a hoarse voice Lady Greengrass noted the obvious, with great difficulty forcing her facial muscles to stretch into a slight smile. Yes. The boy smiled awkwardly, running his hand through his blonde hair. Delphine closed her eyes, immersed in fantasies of righteous retribution that would overtake her student in the morning. So what if it wasn't his fault? The morning of August 10 was rather unusual. The sunbeams, which seemed to have taken on the tradition of waking me up outside of Hogwarts, irritated me with incredible force, bringing me out of the darkness of dreamless sleep. Once consciousness was in reality, I couldn't help but be surprised that I was clearly asleep in a chair. In one of the armchairs in the main hall of Lady Greengrass's country house. My brains were not yet working sufficiently, and I had to strain to understand the reasons for such a thing. Ritual unplanned fragmentation of consciousness, lack of resources. And then everything is completely strange. It's good that I kind of came to my senses and didn't mess up two big things. I even found a Delphine and brought her home. Well, am I not a good fellow an extremely controversial statement? Oh, my schizophrenia, you're still here. That's good news. I got up from the chair and looked around, the common room was unchanged and Delphine was still asleep on the couch, covered by a warm-looking blanket. Stretching, along the way, slightly flexing the muscles that were stiff from an unusual and not particularly comfortable position, I went to my room. After changing clothes there, I went outside to run, think, sort out the information from Rowena. The August morning forest was full of coolness and pleasant smells. It was while jogging through a forest like this that I turned to Rowena for information. Well. What had happened there yesterday a flood of information rushed into my consciousness. And now, please, with a verbal interpretation. In this case, to begin with, let's analyze your division of consciousness. Let's imagine a model that is incorrect but can explain the situation. Let's say that the whole totality of many states, physical, magical, spiritual, and others that can only be imagined and that make up you, the planet. The mind is the population, reasonable and not so much. Soul, countries on the surface of continents. If it weren't for your spiritual weapons and other abilities, the country would be alone, in the same climate zone and things like that. But because of the sword, there are other countries. However, they are on other continents, and there is no connection to them. Original. The ritual managed to create that very connection between continents. The population of your country immediately perked up, and those who liked the laws, rules and climate of the new countries quickly packed up their belongings, animals, and plants that would feel better there and fled to the new countries, instantly adjusting to the new conditions. However, the planet remained the same, in a single copy. If earlier the place of the planet in the universe was determined by the policy of only one country, now there are three of them. Moreover, Cataclysms of unknown nature on the planet suddenly began to occur. For some time, the countries argued peacefully about who would be the main, but in the face of a common threat, cataclysms, they created a council and began to solve common problems, putting forward their proposals. Equivalent. What about now? Well, once the problem was solved, the connection between the continents began to be lost. The inhabitants of the countries did not want to be isolated and the effectiveness of governing the planet in isolation from each other would be highly questionable. After a referendum, everyone returned to their historic homeland, but the production facilities remained on the continents. Autonomous and supplying products of their activity to the main continent. True, not very efficiently. And after such a journey, haven't these inhabitants changed not much, but they just lived where they felt most comfortable and then returned. It's like a vacation, they looked at others showed themselves, and then went back home. With Souvenirs Chapter 299 For about a minute, 
still running through the woods, jumping over tree roots and other uneven terrains, I pondered this analogy this way and that. Still, for a better understanding, I should use some occlumency techniques later, in a quiet environment, to learn the essence of these souvenirs. However, even now, I can say that they will be hidden in slightly altered reactions to stimuli. Slightly altered. It may not even be noticeable. Okay. What about the body for a complete understanding, it will be necessary to combine my information with the data from the ritual that Delphine received because for the purity of the experiment, I did not use spells or magic, analyzing only body sensations and other information that usually passes the consciousness and even the subconscious of a person. For the next few minutes, Rowena talked about what roughly happened to the body. It turned out to be nothing special, as absurd as that sounds. Every full moon, the parameters of the body do increase slightly, as do the output of magic and the control of hemomancy. However, the point of the ritual is to manifest the final stage, so to speak. The problem turned out to be that at the current level of development of the body and with the existing genome, even taking into account the changes from the restoration of the body, taking into account the soul of the basilisk, this very final stage is simply unattainable for me without self-destruction. In order to avoid this self-destruction, my body required an infusion of magic and hemomancy energy far more significant than my soul and body could produce. However, the ritual tried to forcibly reveal this form, the energy consumption began. The shattered consciousness, giving in to the instinct of self-preservation, tried to solve the problem, but each in its own way. The option of absorbing the necessary resources from the outside was accepted for execution. The first source of resources was Delphine, so I tried to get to her. Or is saying I not very appropriate never mind. Anyway, when I got to Delphine, the three countries, none of which had humanity in them, somehow scanned the woman and came to the conclusion that it was unwise to drink or eat or otherwise consume Delphine. It's like eating the whole of some delicious fruit instead of planting it. Neither Rowena nor I could figure out what exactly this trio conjured in the woman's body. It was definitely meant to make her more tasty in the long run so that there would be more goodies and their resource would be replenished quickly. Based on my own memory and knowledge, I always have access to this resource. It sounds awfully vulgar no matter how you look at it, but the fact is that there is no vulgar context at all. It seems that the three countries did not think that the situation would go back to square one, so they made such an investment in the future and in their quiet existence without any fuss. To provide the body with energy and to stop the beginning of the energy and physical degradation with decay, it was decided to go to the evil place. Nocturne Alley was chosen because of quite rational considerations, who cares about scum it took only a minute to find a small lair of werewolves. Three of them, in whom I saw something that I didn't like very much, I immediately turned into porcelain dolls and left them in reserve. I decided to use Hermione's energy resonance spell and other knowledge to fuel the body, which resulted in the following, I caught a werewolf, poured some of my magic and hemomancy energy into it, and triggered the process of energy resonance in the victim's body. As a result, like an engine on an ungodly afterburner, the victim began to produce an incredible amount of diverse energy, which I absorbed. Of course, the victim's body would wear out incredibly quickly in this mode and essentially die of old age. Still, because of the partially adopted functions of my sword body, even organics were eventually converted into energy. The funny thing is that I have a hard time remembering what happened because of the difference in perception from each personality. It's just a wild contradictory mess in my head. I also find it funny that I met Aunt Bellatrix in the Nocturne in the company of Professor Snape. If I remember correctly how she was perceived by my consciousnesses in the magical and other planes, then she has many serious reasons to take care of herself, both in terms of health and appearance. Although, it's hard for me to judge the latter because these three personalities did not look at the appearance at all. On the way back, I came across another unknown werewolf, who was doing something in a dark corner. He suffered the fate of past victims, but it was his energy that stabilized the state of the body, and then the Delphine ritual worked. Even if the final stage of transformation was not reached, but as soon as it was stabilized, the magic circuit embedded in the body stopped forcibly maintaining the resulting form and turned off, and all the changes reversed. Along with this, consciousness returned to normal. However, the werewolves did not die in vain the effectiveness of control over the energy of hemomancy and magic increased, albeit not phenomenally. At the same time, judging by Rowena's report, the effectiveness of hemomancy in relation to my body has also increased, 
which means that passive and active amplifications will work somewhat better. However, this also means that it will be harder to weaken myself to the human level, the load on the nervous system will grow, A and D. And I don't care at all about such ephemeral flaws. It is generally useful to keep your brains in good shape, and constant concentration on hemomancy and magic, in general, is only a plus. Chapter 300, Chapter 301 Hmm, I see. So the changes in the body provoke a greater production of magic for its own needs. Yes. Exactly, but such conclusions need to be made only in conjunction with the following data. These troughs. Delphine pointed to some of the lowered sections of the three-dimensional graph, located at the other end of them and symmetrically to the energy production indicators. These troughs tell us about the expenditure of magic and other energies and resources by the body. If we bring the indicators of energy production and absorption to one number, we will get a small remainder, which is the magical and energy background of the being. Now, look at the second one. What can you say? From the looks of it. I thought for a moment, looking at all that red data. There's a clear increase in all the parameters and a shift in the balance. I don't know in which direction. I need to know the transcript for this. But where the energy, production, and consumption indicators you mentioned earlier were, the changes are the biggest. The output jumped up about the same level as the other indicators, but slightly higher. But consumption? Where is it, anyway? Good thinking, smiled Delphine. But you really need to know more to interpret it. Such a chart displays the numerical interpretation and the balance of the system because, for example, an increase in consumption makes the corresponding areas go down, not up. The boundary values that this scheme can display, however, depend on the wizard processing the information. If, in his perception, the data go beyond what he can imagine, then it falls down or, conversely, grows beyond the boundaries displayed. Look, the indicators of the body are so high that they hardly fit in my head, and these DIPs. Do you see how sharp they are? Yes, I see. The steepness of the formed slope shows how far out of bounds these parameters are at all for the wizard who processed the data. It turns out that the moment the ritual forced the body to reach the final phase of turning into something, the energy expenditure metrics rose to sky-high heights. Exactly. To the sky-high in my understanding. But it turns out that such schemes aren't particularly revealing since every wizard has his own limits on what's acceptable in his imagination. Yes, but that's for personal works. That kind of data isn't usually shared, and it's rarely used for lack of need. Okay. But what does this scheme give us well, besides the knowledge of the monstrous energy consumption? Delphine smiled. Except for that factor, we can say that your final form is virtually no different in appearance or power balance from your normal state. The level of strength is another matter. As with the first two spectrograms, these graphs differ greatly, even among twins. Only a blind person will not see the difference between a werewolf in the normal and lunar phases. Hmm, then, to complete the picture, I also have a story to tell. In half an hour, I told Lady Greengrass about how I perceived everything around me during the ritual and about some of my peculiarities. I didn't mention the spirit sword and hemomancy, turning them into the strange ability to absorb some energy and magic, and, if strongly desired, to destroy constructs. The latter was verified. Delphine thought for ten minutes after this story and gave a verdict, weird shit. Yesterday, lying under a tree, she thought that my transformation had something to do with vampires because I have fangs and was obviously going to drink her blood or something like that. However, after interpreting the data, this option was discarded. Vampires, like werewolves in the lunar phase, are radically different in indicators. In my case, 
there is not even a partial change in the image of vampires. I also told her about how my consciousness split into three slightly dumber but more capable parts in terms of manipulating energies. This story interested her the most because it was directly related to the changes made to her body, and judging by the interest in her eyes, the essence of them remained unclear. Naturally, I told her that these individuals saw the Delphine as an energy food, but due to her constant presence in my life recently, they decided to cultivate more delicious food from her, so that for longer and more often. Delphine's face remained impassive, but I could see in her eyes a serious struggle of various and contradictory emotions, which were occasionally replaced by thoughtfulness. It lasted at least a minute, and after a particularly prolonged reflection, Lady Greengrass smiled and then laughed, leaning against the table and propping her head with a hand. Ha ha ha! And I wondered what the point of these changes was. Why make changes to the body of a defeated opponent and it turns out that everything is simple why run for food if it can be grown? Something like that, I twirled my hand in a gesture of uncertainty. I haven't quite figured out the logic of what happened myself. Do you know what exactly, has changed? Not really, Delphine returned a calm expression to her face. If you look at the same spectrograms, you can see how some unbalanced indicators have leveled out, energy production has increased significantly across all spectra, but the consumption has also come close. The process is still clearly underway. Chapter 302 Actually, I'm pretty surprised by both your numbers and the changes. What's so surprising? Any chimerologist in his work seeks to create a perfectly balanced organism. Even naturally evolved beings lack balance. It is said that the lack of this balance, in general, led to the formation of chimerology as a magical science, not the desire to create an unknown beast not the desire to create a fighting machine, but precisely to achieve perfect balance. Equilibrium Your readings are close to the desired, and it's very interesting. Among other things, your consciousness, albeit fragmented, but possessing your knowledge, managed to smooth out undesirable elements in my work on my own body by some manipulations, bringing the data closer to balanced. What do you know that no one else knows? This question made me think. Really, what is so special that I know him? I decided to think out loud. I have a perfect memory. Almost the entire restricted section is stored there, a lot of diverse literature on the Hogwarts curriculum, the usual school curriculum, the average level of general knowledge of medical, technical and natural sciences of ordinary people. Understanding the principles of operation of so many devices of the ordinary world. Yes, a lot of things. Delphine leaned back in her chair thoughtfully, and putting her hand on the table, began to involuntarily tap her finger on the tabletop. I waited patiently. It makes sense, she said quietly. Most of the magical disciplines of our time have their origins in antiquity partially formed in the 12th century, and finally, only at the beginning of the 19th century. Wizards throughout history have been many steps ahead of ordinary people in the matter of knowing the world around them. Always, until the middle of this century. Therefore, now some guilds are actively lobbying for training programs taking into account muggle knowledge. The conservatism of wizards knows no bounds. It's incredibly difficult. By virtue of my upbringing, I am also a conservative, although I struggle with this trait of mine for the sake of knowledge and strength. No wonder, I couldn't hold back a slight smirk. The means of cognition are radically different, as are the results of the substantiation of certain phenomena. If I understood correctly from the books, Wizards only 200 years ago began to actively use arithmancy for the widespread compilation of models of the world and phenomena around them. Do you think that the fusion of various, albeit not very deep knowledge that I have in my head allowed such manipulations to be carried out? 
why not it is a pity that it is impossible to extract the train of thought from memory. And most likely, it would not have worked. My experience in occlumency tells me that the reverse merge most likely turned the memories into mush. I liked that Lady Greengrass came to the same conclusions as I did. Almost until the very end of the day, we analyzed the ritual results and deciphered certain data, simultaneously coming to the same conclusions. Given that long-lived werewolves over the years adopt some habits and elements of appearance that make them related to the beast, and every full moon, this effect increases by a tiny fraction of a percent, then a similar situation should be with me. However, I am not turning into anyone, but only improving, and therefore, every month, I will become stronger, and the limit of these forces is still unknown. However, even if we roughly estimate the time frame, then the level shown during the ritual will be reached in 50 years, maybe more. A personality disorder is a side effect of the ritual, which tried to realize the full potential of soul and body. At the same time, the upper bar was not reached, and the abrupt load with a pood hammer hit the consciousness, breaking it into several parts, these are our conclusions. The changes launched in the Delphin's body are not negative and pursue a purely positive goal at least, this is what happens according to our calculations. That is, in fact, all the conclusions obtained on the basis of the data from the ritual, but, strangely enough, it was more than enough for peace of mind. However, Delphine can't do magic properly yet. At least the energy-consuming areas of transfiguration that rely heavily on the wizard's power are not yet available to her, but by all appearances, it will not be for more than a week. Chapter 303 In the evening, when we had finished sorting out the results, checked my curriculum, and agreed on a schedule of personal studies that would only take place once a week, we sat down to drink tea. We are sitting in armchairs at a table in the main hall, and my curiosity does not want to stop. Master, perhaps my curiosity is unnecessary, but I couldn't help but notice that whenever you are distracted from your work, you immediately start to worry about something. Sitting across from me, Delphine put her cup of tea on the table and looked at me thoughtfully, remaining silent for a long half minute. If you want to know so much, Delphine leaned back in her chair, resting her hands on the armrests. The situation in England has begun to escalate dramatically. Many people don't see it or can't see it. Others ignore it. Many rich and influential families began to act. Immortality is a strange thing. Everyone wants it, but no one aspires to it. But those who, against all odds, have achieved it cause immeasurable respect from other wizards. Only a few know about horcruxes, but no one uses this magic, trying to keep the most precious thing, their soul, intact. Voldemort told everyone a long time ago that he had achieved immortality. Still, even a wizard who knows about horcruxes would never suspect him of it, creating a horcrux goes against our worldview. No wonder. I'm talking about the desire to save the soul. Its presence is not a secret for wizards. Lady Greengrass nodded in agreement and continued her thought. Now, among the wealthy, influential and potentially allied families to the Dark Lord, information is circulating, reliable information about his rebirth. Those who were with him in the past, voluntarily or under duress, will join again. Those who doubted will believe and join him. A little money and sweet speeches with promises, and all who are dissatisfied with their lives, from the poor to the rich, will come running to him because he has achieved immortality. Does that bother you? Oh, no, Delphine smiled sadly. Other factors bother me, but this preface was necessary. The Green Grass family has both influence in certain circles and finances. But beyond that, to the community, we are one of the sacred 28, and believe me, that means a lot. However, 
from what I understand, when Henry, with Voldemort's help, threw off some restrictions, justly deserved, by the way, he told a lot about the family's secrets. Many of the families who have been or will soon be on the Dark Lord's side, as I said, have political weight. The Dark Lord may well be interested in our knowledge, which means my family would be under considerable political pressure. I am sure that if Henry had not died, they would soon try to remove me or otherwise force me to make the right decision. If it weren't for the situation, my father would be the official face of the family again, but now. It's the worst case scenario because of the consequences of one incident, he's almost a squib, and the public knows it. You can see how that might work out. My only option is to enter the political and other arenas, though even now, very few initiates know about. Lady Greengrass fell silent and looked at me as if waiting for me to continue. That you are the actual head of the house. Exactly, she nodded, smiling and fixing the thick braid of almost white hair on her shoulder with her hand. So now all that remains is either to persuade me to cooperate or... I see a lot of options. They can bring the situation to the marriage of Daphne or Astoria, on favorable terms to the other side, knock out the rest of the family members, and that's it. I wouldn't be surprised if Henry's plans included a similar option. For example, eliminate you with the help of Voldemort's forces, give Astoria to the same Malfoy as Regent, for example, since their family is loyal to the Dark Lord, do something with Daphne, and that's it. Your father, because of his magical weakness, won't be able to resist in any way. Why Astoria specifically Delphine tilted her head slightly sideways, looking at me intently. She seemed to me quite a smart and quick-witted girl. Oddly enough, this is the best option for taking over a family. She will figure everything out pretty quickly and will want to solve the problem with her mind. And while she is playing the role of an obedient wife and looking for a solution, everything will already be over. Daphne, it seems to me, is quite a hot-tempered and wayward person who does not sit still, not the best option. I was thinking along the same lines. Of course, there's always the option of a forcible takeover. However, you know what disciplines in magic I know, right? Nodding. I took a cup of still hot tea from the table and, after taking a couple of sips, returned it to its place. To fight against such a wizard on his own territory, even surpassing him in strength, is an extremely suicidal enterprise. However, so few people know about my master titles that wizards under the leadership of Voldemort will undoubtedly rush to storm the manor. If necessary. Chapter 304 Mentor I have a question that has tormented me since the very tournament. Why not just leave the country even if Voldemort manages to really seize power, suppress pockets of resistance, start his muggle-hating campaign, he will not immediately rush abroad. That's impossible, Delphine shook her head negatively. Imagine a small town with absolutely no information or rumors from the outside world. Sooner or later, certain people and families will gain influence, concentrate resources and production in their hands. Whether they like it or not, their names will be on the lips of the commoners and other successful families. As the years and centuries go by, the town gradually grows, and the influence of these families grows in proportion. And now, if someone talks, for example, about a bakery and good bread, everyone has one family name on their lips. Famous military careerists are on everyone's lips, and everyone knows them. The best blacksmiths, any bum will tell you where their family forge is. Rumors, information, reputation. Everyone knows these people, and everyone is happy to see them. Now imagine that this little town is the magical world of Europe and the continental Americas, and these well-known family names are old families. We have been building our reputation and respect for hundreds of years, 
and our names literally open doors almost everywhere. However, with just one act, you can bring down this reputation so that even the last loser in rags and without nut behind his soul will consider it his duty to spit in your face. We took cups of tea from the table and sink, but they were empty. Delphine levitated the teapot into the air with a gesture of her hand and poured us some more hot drink. You don't have to look far for examples, Delphine continued again. The Weasley family, despite their ancient roots, have always held mostly positive views towards muggles. However, they have always been truly pure-blooded in the best sense of the word they have a rich history and traditions. And absolutely everyone didn't care about their interests and hobbies because the old families knew that the Weasleys were a family whose honor had been tested by time. But as soon as they publicly declared that ordinary people, their mores, hobbies, and interests are more important to them than their own magical heritage, their entire reputation collapsed. None of the influential, wealthy, or even just firmly standing on their feet families no longer wanted to have anything to do with them. It didn't take a century, and the old, respected, and wealthy family turned into what you see now. Just one act. Taking a break for a couple of minutes, we paid attention to tea, along the way enjoying wonderful cookies with the most delicate raisins. It doesn't matter, Lady Greengrass continued, who wins in the upcoming conflict. If one of the old families suddenly decides to escape, pack up and leave, then everything that these families have achieved over the years will be destroyed. Whatever the outcome. It was the same situation in the 70s. Note that running away is a really logical and simple way out. But no one escaped. Yes, old relatives or very young children tried to take out of the country if there was an opportunity. It's much easier for muggle-borns or wizards in the second or third generations. When you don't have a lineage of ancestors behind your soul when no one has ever heard of you, and even after Hogwarts, only a couple of people will remember you, your last name is an empty word to most, and your belongings fit in a bag over your shoulder, then yes, nothing holds you back, and there is no difference for you where to go and where to live, building your future. Hmm. That seems like a somewhat strange position to me, though lately, I'm beginning to understand that sort of thing. Beyond that, there is now another problem. For the general public, the green grass adhered to neutrality, but now that Henry has found himself, albeit for a short time, in the circle of Voldemort's closest supporters, and information about this is spreading among certain circles with incredible speed, the whole scheme of neutrality is collapsing. It is necessary to take new measures, prepare for various undercover games, ensure the safety of family members, and I personally have to go out, negotiate and most likely revise old agreements, adjust what is planned, and all this under the pressure of circumstances. For example, in three days, there will be a reception at the Malfoy Manor in honor of Draco's formal acceptance of the status of the head of the house. The conversation was interrupted again, giving us the opportunity to enjoy tea. Chapter 305 such an invitation, on the one hand, shows that the inviting party appreciates the presence of the invitee because you don't invite just anyone. But on the other hand, it is not a visit for tea, which you can refuse using any, even the most delusional argument. Among other things, it is customary to invite colleagues to such parties, but excuse me. Delphine smiled. What colleagues the Hogwarts students? Here lies the second reason why I can't refuse it is customary for a girl to go to such events accompanied by an older lady. Just to invite her to visit, no problem. Walks, restaurants, and even a trip to another country on vacation don't require such a thing. Why refuse at all? Flair and albeit not complete, but information about the list of invitees. This is not the first time the Malfoy family has hosted various events and receptions. 
the people invited to them could always be of very different views and spheres of activity, but they were united by one factor a profitable contact for the Malfoy family. But at the upcoming reception, the list of invitees would form a very different picture. There will be those once suspected of having ties to the Death Eaters, political radicals of purity of blood, families who supported Voldemort previously, a few neutrals, and a few wizards to dilute the list. With many of these families, it is harmful to the Malfoys not just to have a business, but even to contact, and here it is. This is atypical. It is not right. Illogical. And therefore, suspicious. So you need to go to this appointment anyway. Yes, Delphine nodded. But that's half the trouble, too. Already I, in turn, need to arrive there accompanied, since officially I am not the head of the house, and Henry's death has not been confirmed for obvious reasons. That's true because Protego Diabolica leaves no trace, and officially no one was in that cemetery. No one would voluntarily testify about a person's death under any circumstances, for it would lead to a DMLE investigation. There would be traces of dark magic, the Aurors would get involved. Of course, the case can be hushed up quite easily, but this is a waste of money. The regular meetings of the Wisengamot are held four times a year, and failure to attend an extraordinary meeting is punishable by a fine of 100 galleons a trifle. Perhaps I should have communicated more with the portrait of Lady Walberga for a deeper understanding of the essence of the local Sepentarium while I was thinking, Delphine continued to speak. So it turns out that I can't go alone, I can't take the first man I meet without damaging my reputation and the couple of people whose presence is acceptable by etiquette and other things will never go there. And what a wonderful coincidence! Delphine clasped her hands together artistically. There are several candidates whose company is a decision that is controversial and very slippery, I would say. But more than that, they are radicals, and more importantly, they have written themselves, saying, Dear lady, we have learned, the situation, reception. I invite you. Some kind of intrigue is as obvious as possible, some kind of rush is felt, but also the situation itself is close to hopeless when something is required of you, and all other decisions will be bad anyway. Twirling the cup of tea in my hands, I looked at Lady Greengrass, who was looking thoughtfully at the same cup in her hands, as if there, at the bottom, you can find the answer to all your questions. Well, if that's the case, I decide to clarify some points that may not be known to Delphine. Then I must tell you that Voldemort has settled in Malfoy Manor for an unknown period of time with the Death Eaters who escaped from Azkaban. I don't know how big the mansion is, but I think there is quite enough space there to accommodate guests and to hold this banquet. Delphine frowned a little and her gaze reflected the work of thought. However, this did not last long because the conclusions are already obvious, and my information only confirmed them. I was overcome by almost imperceptible but mixed feelings. On the one hand, Lady Greengrass is the head of the house, a master in the three branches of magic and in their combat application, which translates into four masteries. She's smart enough, and the fact that she grew up in the highest magical society should be good for her ability to get out of delicate situations. On the other hand, as a young man with a classical, I would say, upbringing and worldview in both lives, I am disgusted by the idea that a beautiful young woman will literally go into the lion's mouth without support. Although, specifically in this case, it will be more appropriate to say snake's mouth. And even if we put aside my worldview, there is another possible problem, my apprenticeship. The problem is that if Voldemort gets the green grasses on his side one way or another, he won't stop at a simple pact of support or something like that, no. He will demand more, taking control of both the house and Delphine. There will be marriages that are beneficial to him, 
marks, oaths of some kind, not just the unbreakable vow. It would all affect me as Delphine's apprentice, from the banal reputation of a Death Eater apprentice, which Voldemort will definitely try and make a Delphine, to a simple obligation to follow her as my master. After all, one of the reasons I asked Delphine for an apprenticeship was her de facto neutrality. That is all for today. Thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this journey, make sure to subscribe and ring that notification bell. If you have any suggestions or feedback for me, please drop a comment down below.